also want to mention at the table to the side and I think also to the back of the room, there's information sheets about the league, some League of Women uh, voter handouts. Uh, if you want to follow our activities or become involved with the league, you can write your name and uh, email address on the sheet at the back of the room. In addition, there's literature about Ballot Measure 101 at this table. It includes a one-page unbiased summary of the measure from the League of Women Voters of Oregon. Oh, that one's back there, apparently, I've been told. Uh, and then there's information provided by both sides of the measure over here. How long is it going to take? A couple minutes. Okay, I'll continue. <clears throat> Uh, I want to explain how the forum's going to proceed. Uh, first, Linda Ziedrich, who's the president of our local league, is going to provide a brief neutral explanation of Ballot Measure 101. Uh, then each presenter is going to have five minutes to do an opening statement. After that, we'll take questions from the audience, and the presenters will have one minute to answer each question from the audience. At the end of the forum, each presenter will then have a one-minute closing statement. Uh, we have provided index cards for audience questions. They were handed out at the door. They were placed on your seats. Uh, these, you can, at this point in time, if you want to have questions, please write them down. Raise them in the air. Somebody will come collect them uh, and provide the questions up here. If you need an index card, Raise your hand also, and we'll get you an index card. Uh, please be sure to write legibly. If you don't hear your question being read, it may be because it's a duplicate or because it wasn't legible. Um, let's see. <clears throat> As I, I did say earlier in this event, this is an educational event. Uh, so we request that you give your full and respectful attention to each presenter and hold any clause till the end of the program. Uh, at this point, I'm going to introduce our presenters. <coughs> Excuse me. At my, <coughs> at my left is Lindsay Bauscher. Bershauer. Bershauer. <laughs> she told me how to say it, and I knew I'd get it wrong. Okay. So. Uh, she is the owner of Leona Consulting Company, a political and public affairs firm. She began her work in Oregon public policy at Cascade Policy Institute, where she successfully argued against the 2011 Portland Public Schools bond measure. Afterwards, she served as a director of the Oregon Transformational Project. After founding Leona Construction Consulting in 2013, she contested the Columbia River Crossing Project. Over the past five years, she has organized candidate and issue campaigns throughout Oregon. Lindsay helped preserve the state's small business tax cut, and last year she partnered with the Stop Health Care Taxes petitioners to gather signatures to allow the public vote on Measure 101. Lindsay is board president for Building Excellent Schools Together, a group that promotes school choice. She's also a member of the Wilsonville Public Policy Council, and a board director for the Newburgh Rural Fire Protection District. Next we have uh, former state representative Jeff Kropp. He is a fifth generation farmer from the Halsey Harrisburg area, a former radio broadcaster, a former firefighter, a co-founder of the Oregon Connections Academy, and a small business owner. For eight years he represented Oregon House Districts 37 and 17. After retiring from the House of Representatives in 2007, he organized a team that built up the Oregon chapter of Americans for Prosperity. And in 2011, he founded the Oregon Capital Watch Foundation. As a passionate advocate for common sense government budget reform, he speaks regularly to various organizations. Beside Jeff, we have Dr. Bruce Thompson, who completed his residency at Oregon Health Sciences University in 1993. He retired from 20 years of private practice in family medicine in 2014, and since 1999 he has served as Benton County Health Officer. Based on his experiences in these two areas of health care, he's become an advocate for publicly funded, privately delivered universal <coughs> health care. Since 1990, he has given testimony to the Oregon Legislature on health-related issues. 
He is not representing any opinions or policies of the Benton County Health Department here. But he is here as a private citizen to present his personal views as a physician and advocate in favor of a yes vote on Measure 101. Finally, at the end of the table, we have Janet Bauer, who is a policy analyst at the Oregon Center for Public Policy. The center does public policy research and an anal an analysis to promote an economically prosperous Oregon where residents at all income levels have a meaningful opportunity to thrive. Janet focuses on health policy as well as public support such as temporary assistance to needy families, SNAP, ch child care assistance, and earned income tax credit. She joined the center in 2005 and holds a master's degree in urban studies from Portland State University. <laughs> Well, then you'll be jumping up and down a lot. We can pass it back and forth. Yeah, that's fine. I think that'll that's work fine. out better. All right, so we now have a microphone. Hopefully the people won't have to yell like I was doing. I, sorry about that. Um, so I would like to start uh, with Linda Ziedrich, who is going to do the brief uh, overview of Ballot Measure 101. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Robert. Ballot Measure 101 asks voters to approve or reject the temporary assessments created through House Bill 2391, which the Oregon Legislature passed last July. House Bill 2391 provides funding both to pay health care costs of low-income and disabled Oregonians and to stabilize health insurance premiums purchased by individuals and families. The legislature passed House Bill 2391 to correct a budget shortfall for the Oregon Health Plan, Oregon's Medicaid program. In 2014, the Affordable Care Act began providing federal funds to Oregon and other states to expand Medicaid coverage. This allowed Oregon to cover 350,000 previously uninsured residents with incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty level. Initially, the federal government paid all the costs of expanded coverage. In 2017, however, Oregon was required to pay 5% of the costs, and the state's required contribution has increased to 6% for 2018. Oregon's contribution will continue to increase by 1% yearly until it is capped at 10% in 2020. By the end of 2016, the Oregon Health Plan faced a $1.6 billion budget shortfall. The legislature passed House Bill 2391 with a three-fifths majority required for tax bills to ensure that the shortfall would not result in the loss of matching federal funds and the loss of insurance for the 350,000 Oregonians. The bill specified that some of the revenue from the temporary assessments would be used for reinsurance or, or stop-loss insurance, which would protect insurers from the risk of very large claims and so allow them to lower their premiums. The temporary assessments, or taxes as some prefer to call them, are as follows. 1.5% on premiums or similar payments collected by health insurance companies, the Public Employees Benefit Board, and managed care organizations for a two-year period, and an added 0.7% to the current assessment on the net rev revenue of certain hospitals from October 2017 through June 2019. The measure permits insurance companies to pass their assessments on to consumers by increasing the cost of premiums, but not by more than 1.5%. Measure 101 is a veto referendum, which means it was placed on the ballot through the efforts of citizens, in this case, three members of the Oregon legislature, so that voters could decide whether to overturn the decision of the legislature as a whole. A yes vote on ballot measure 101 will retain House Bill 2391 in its entirety as it was passed by the legislature. A no vote on measure 101 would repeal five sections of House Bill 2391 <coughs> with the intention of removing both the 1.5% assessment on health insurance premiums and the 0.7% assessment on hospital revenues. 
The petitioners and the Legislative Council disagree, however, over whether a no vote would actually repeal the hospital tax. The remaining sections of House Bill 2391 took effect on January 1st. It is estimated that defeat of Measure 101 would reduce state revenue by $210 to $320 million. This could reduce federal matching funds for Medicaid by $630 to $960 million. The total reduction to the 2017 to 2019 state budget could range from $840 million to more than $1.3 billion. We do have a couple seats still up here. People uh, that are standing want to sit down. So, just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> All right, uh, we're now going to start with our opening statements, and I believe that Bruce was first. Is that correct? All right. Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming, and thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about health. Uh, this, after all, has been what I've been doing for the last 20 years of my life. Uh, I, I believe that uh, health care is a human right. Um, I believe that uh, 39 other countries around the world have already figured this out, and I don't understand why our country hasn't figured it out. I haven't always believed that health care was a human right. It's been a process. Um, it is for a lot of people. Um, I was a slow learner, I guess, but that's where I'm at. It has to do with the fact that about a third of my patient population in my family practice, private practice of family medicine, so I was the owner of my practice. I was not employed by some big system. I didn't like working in big systems although I did appreciate my education at Oregon Health Sciences University. Um, I, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, over the last 20 years, I've uh, delivered babies, I've taken care of the newborn, mom, grandma, grandpa, gran great-grandfather, great-grandmother. That's what family medicine does. So uh, we see all, all kinds of people, all walks of life, and uh, you, you know, if you're going to be a good doctor, you need to understand where your folks are coming from. So about a third of my folks were coming from the Medicaid population. And uh, I got to learn a lot about their trials and tribulations going through life. Some of these folks now uh, are on the uh, expansion population uh, because of the Affordable Care Act. And some of them were working, uh, you know, dad was working two jobs, mom was working one job, just in order to be able to pay the rent and feed the family. Um, and thank goodness they were able to get on to the Medicaid expansion and have, uh, have health insurance. Uh, it cost about $14,000 to have your appendix removed these days. Uh, in, in other countries, it's only about $7,000, but it's paid uh, for you. Uh, so uh, with this um, Measure 101, uh, w what's at risk is those 350,000 people uh, who had been on the Medicaid expansion uh, not being able to get that. And what that will do to our health care system is that the hospitals will end up doing charity care, the hospitals will end up um, having to increase their rates, um, and then as a result of that, the insurance companies, for those of you who have private insurance, will have to pay higher rates because that's how the system works right now. Uh, in case you didn't know that. Um, so it's really important to, for all of us, for all of society, to, uh, to pass Measure uh, 101, to say yes to Measure 101. This was a negotiated settlement with Republicans and Democrats, and uh, it's affecting lives of people. My son actually is on Medicare because uh, Medicaid because of a um, spinal cord injury that he suffered in an accident on a beach in uh, a river in Idaho uh, 16 years ago uh, and I saw my life crumble in front of my eyes when I looked down and saw my son face down in the water not knowing if he was dead or alive. Fortunately uh, he only had a, 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 a broken neck, he didn't die um, and <clears throat> as a result of the uh, support uh, 
provided through the Medicaid program. He was able to complete high school. He was able to graduate from, uh, he's a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. Uh, um, graduate U of O Honors College in English, go on to get a master's in philosophy. Uh, he is, uh, for the past four or five years, he served on the city uh, of Eugene Human Rights Commission, and all of this is because he has backing, he has his health care taken care of, that he can make these contributions to society. I know many people in my practice of medicine that are doing similar things working hard to pay for food and rent. They can't afford insurance. They love being on uh, Medicaid expansion. That's, uh, I think my time's about up, isn't it? I'll have more to say later, hopefully. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. I'm sorry. I'm gonna try this because I talk with my hands a lot, so that might be a bad combination here. <laughs> So, well, maybe not. So, I think we need to establish that no one up here believes that anyone should be dropping off of Medicaid. Dr. Bruce, I heard your story. My son is actually sitting in the front row here. And <laughs> I think we need to establish that all of us care about maintaining the folks who are currently on Medicaid. That is a given. I want to talk about briefly about Measure 101 and what it actually means. I don't know if anybody's read the ballot title. Has anybody read the ballot title? Were you, you, could, were, were you as confused as I was? Yes. yes. Okay. That's by design, and Jeff's going to talk about that. <laughs> but what it boils down to is basically two things. It's a 1.5% tax on health care premiums that are purchased on the individual market. So if you are an individual and you are purchasing health care on the market or you are purchasing it for your family or you are a small business or a nonprofit or you have college students who are purchasing health care as a condition of their university residency, all of those people will be paying a 1.5% premium on top of their health care premiums that they purchase on the plan. It also includes a 0.7% tax on hospitals. And this is not what we call a closed loop tax, where the federal government comes back and gives us a reimbursement for the money we spend on that. It is a separate tax, and it is a, what we call a hard tax on hospitals, which means that anybody who walks through the door of a hospital or uses the services of a hospital will be paying that tax. The hospital associations are not going to eat the cost of that tax for, the, for their own good. They are going to pass it on to you. It is a direct consumer tax. Those are the two most egregious parts of House Bill 2391. You heard about that a little bit earlier. So why are we here? Why do you have Measure 101 in front of you? I'll tell you why. Two legislators, Representative Julie Parrish and Representative Dr. Cedric Hayden. Representative Parrish grew up in poverty. She was on the Medicaid system almost her entire life. She knows full well what it means to be on that system. Dr. Cedric Hayden is a Medicaid practitioner. He's a dentist. He provides low-income dental care for Medicaid patients. Both of them have an absolute commitment to making sure that the Medicaid system works. But both of those legislators understood the harm that the taxes involved in Measure 101 would do to Oregonians. And they decided that it was more important to ask Oregonians what they thought. If you agreed that we should go tax other people's health insurance to pay for Medicaid expansion. And so at the end of the last legislative session, they went out and asked Oregonians. They had 90 days to get roughly 70,000 signatures. And that's when I joined in and helped them as a volunteer. My organization did as well. And I'll tell you, it's pretty daunting for anybody who has ever worked on petition uh, gathering efforts before. 
90,000 Oregonians signed that petition in 90 days. That's a thousand Oregonians a day that understood the harm that will come from Measure 101's taxes. 90,000 Oregonians. That's why you have this in front of you. Your neighbors, 90,000 of them from across the state, from every political party, are asking you to stand with them and say no to egregious taxes on health care plans in hospitals. I have very little time left, but I'm going to talk briefly about, uh, I hope someone asked me about Plan B, because if you vote no on January 23rd, there is a Plan B and the sky is not going to fall. So let's talk about that in the q and I hope someone asked me about that. The yes on health care folks. They have spent close to $3 million. Okay, I'll talk about that later. Janet, did you want to sit or come up here? He was talking, was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, was it? Great. Great. Okay. The good news about being short <laughs> is that I, for once, can be heard. <laughs> So good evening. Um, I'm Janet Bauer and I'm a policy analyst with the Oregon Center for Public Policy. Um, at the Oregon Center for Public Policy, we believe that um, people should be able to see a doctor or nurse when they get sick. This particular issue is personal for me. I have a brother-in-law who works full-time, has Asperger's, and for much of his working life has not had health insurance. His getting health care was an ongoing crisis. A couple years ago, he was able to join the Oregon Health Plan, and the situation radically changed and improved for him. I'm now concerned that he could lose his coverage. I'm going to talk about um, three reasons why Measure 101 is important for health care in Oregon. The first is that Measure 101 protects health care for many, many, many Oregonians. A million Oregonians are served by the Oregon Health Plan. Measure 101 protects them by raising needed revenue for the program so that they won't need to drop off their program. Uh, there won't need to be any um, uh, reductions in benefits nor um, cuts to the program. Who are we talking about? We're talking about people like my brother-in-law who are newly added to the program. We're talking about 40% of uh, Oregon's children. Uh, they're able to get immunizations and um, regular health care so they can succeed in school. We're talking about low-income seniors and people with disabilities. The second way that Measure 101 helps, uh, is critical to health care in Oregon is because it lowers the cost of private coverage for individuals who buy it on their own. And how it does it is that some of the assessment on insurers goes to lowering the costs and paying for paying the very most expensive claims on the individual market. For instance, babies who are in intensive care, for instance, they would be covered by what's called a reinsurance program. That those dollars are matched by federal dollars and go to lowering costs. In, in the individual market. So insurers can, can lower their premiums for more than the price, more than the level of the assessment. For instance, in this year, uh, uh, their costs are being, are being lowered by 6%, even considering the cost of the assessment. And that is real dollars. It's $300 per person per year on average. The third way that Measure 101 is critical to health care in Oregon is it keeps Oregon's health care system functioning as it should. And here's how. Because Measure 101's reach is so extensive and keeps individuals with insurance, they, have, they can, one, see a doctor when they get sick and they're healthier. Second, they, their bills get paid. And both of those reasons make a, are, are fundamental to a functional system. On the contrary, 
If we were to have a lot more people who cannot get health care, they're sicker, uh, their health care needs go up, and those health care bills do not get paid. That becomes costs that we all share, um, and that is the hallmark of a dysfunctional system. We've made a lot of progress in Oregon, and so we have a choice. Um, we can either continue to move forward and, um, uh, and continue the progress. Measure 101 would allow that. Or we can um, go back and begin dismantling the gains that we've made. So um, the last thing that I'll say is that the federal, the, the dollars that are raised are matched um, on an average of three to one with federal dollars. That is the, the power of our vote, which is that it attracts many, many more dollars to Oregon. Um, there's basically three dollars for every one dollar that, that that the state contributes. So all, each, all of those dollars go to keeping Oregonians healthy. And um, that's another reason why Measure 101 is critical to health care in Oregon. Thank you very much. Do I need this microphone? No. no. <laughs> Thank you uh, for inviting us and for the opportunity to share our perspectives. Um, First off, let me say that I don't believe if Measure 101 is, uh, is not successful, if, if you all vote no the way I want you to, uh, the day after that election, there's a year's worth of funding for all of these Medicaid expansion individuals. Nobody's going to lose their health care. That's the truth. Okay? Now, I've just gone through a very personal experience. My dad just spent 10 days uh, at uh, Good Samaritan. Some of it in ICU. We lost him on the way to the hospital. His heart stopped. A great respect uh, for the professionals and Bruce for your uh, your commitment to to what you believe is is right in terms of being out there. And those of you who are also in the medical profession are out there in the audience today. I have less respect for politicians. <laughs> being a recovering one, I'm going to tell you why. There are five reasons why you should vote no. Number one is the politicians that brought you this issue, House Bill 2391, are lying to you. It is not an assessment. It is a tax. You know why we know it's a tax? Because it triggered Oregon's constitutional requirement that you had to have 36 votes in the House and 18 in the Senate. It is a tax. They're saying it's an assessment. That's deceitful. That's not right. Number two, the same politicians then passed a special bill to rig the election. What do I mean by that? They passed a special bill to circumvent the normal process of who writes the ballot title in the yes or no. Normally, that's the Attorney General. The legislature wrote it. Nowhere in here you will find the word tax. You'll only find the word assessment. It's more deceit. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not fair because it exempts public employee unions, it exempts big corporations who are self-insured, insurance companies. And I'm not the only one who says it's unfair. Oregonian editorial from uh, December 16th here, who says it's unfair, it's inequitable. Okay? And they also describe the dysfunctional, mismanaged, misspending, and the secrecy of the Oregon Health Authority, which manages this. You've seen some of these spectacular stories that are said. It's very, very sad. That's my fourth point. You can't trust OHA to not waste your money. Why? Because of their track record. Why would you give more money to an organization? This is the Reason.com blog post that articulates how much money they've wasted. $305 million on Cover Oregon, the website that never signed up a single person. Then another $116 million for the follow-on uh, IT project called One that also failed. How about another $186 million in improper payments? Another $88 million on top of that. I can go on and on and on. 
money that they've been wasting. Why would you give, why would you reward failure and distrust and secrecy? These are the same people that lied to Governor Brown, by the way. Okay? The fourth, uh, the third thing, fifth thing, actually, is we have the money to pay for this. We don't need a new tax to pay for this. Now, why do I say that? An article based on testimony here by the Oregon economist, state economist, in front of the Oregon legislature saying the Trump tax plan is going to add another 150 to 200 million dollars to the state of Oregon. 150 to 200 million dollars. Now what you should also know is that there are 350,000 people that were signed up originally. Of them, 63,000 have been deemed ineligible. That's roughly 100 million dollars. Okay? So if you add the 200 million dollars that we may get every year from the Trump tax plan, plus the 63,000 people, the 100 million that have been removed, it's a lot less money. There actually is enough money, plus Plan B even has more money for it. The final thing I will say about this is that the federal government says, and this is in the, um, I've got it here somewhere, the Register Guard editorial urging no, Medicaid says that 10% of Medicaid funds are misspent on average across the United States in every state. 10%. Last year, Oregon spent $9.3 billion in Medicaid funding. What's 10% of $9.3 billion? It's $930 million. So we, miss, we misspent hundreds of millions of dollars that were found in an audit. Maybe we ought to be auditing some more and find the rest of it. We have the money. We don't need a new tax. Thank you. So now we're going to start with our questions. And uh, we're doing the question. If you have cards, raise your hand and somebody will pick them up. If you want a card uh, to write a question on, pass it over. Did you need an index card? I already got one. Oh, you got one. one. Okay. Anybody Thank else? You. All right. They'll go around and collect them. I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions. Oh, you've got one. Here. You've got one. All right. So this may be addressed to you, Lindsay, as the plan B. Um, if there is a better way than, H, than the HB. 2391 to fund the expansion of Medicaid in Oregon, then what is the better way? We're just going to pass this around. So there is a plan B, and there was a plan B in the last legislative session. Uh, several legislators introduced alternative plans that wouldn't have taxed other people's health care in order to pay for Medicaid expansion. And some of those included a tobacco tax and other things that would have come up with that $330 million that we're talking about in Measure 101. But we, what we also argue, and Jeff alluded to this, is there has been hundreds of millions of dollars either misspent or mishandled that we can start to claw back and fill that budget hole. And when you hear the yes on health care folks say that 350,000 people are going to lose their health insurance, I want you to know there's absolutely no documentation for that. It doesn't even exist. In fact, the number has changed about five times throughout this campaign. No one on January 24th is going to lose their health insurance. No one. There's plenty of money. Bruce or Janet, did you want to respond? I'll respond. Uh, so uh, I personally know uh, Representative Dan Rayfield sits on the Budgetary Committee and um, uh, Joint Committee uh, and uh, went, went over a myriad of plans with Republican and Democratic legislators. And after numerous uh, because uh, I, I also, one thing I do is I, I follow what's going on in the legislature, right? So I testify up there every once in a while. So um, uh, many, many meetings, many, many hours spent on um, figuring out, negotiating for, sorting out what's the best way to go forward with this, and three-fifths agreed. 
so now we're, we're with and now there's a new plan B, and um, we're going to they're being asked now to spend another myriad number of hours trying to figure out plan B. That seems like governmental waste to me. I'd like to point out he mentioned Representative Dan Rayfield. Representative Dan Rayfield has received more than fifty thousand dollars from the people who are pushing a yes vote on Measure 101. So I just want to make I want to make that clear. Did you want to respond? A lot of politicians receive a lot of money in the Oregon Legislature. It's it's an open game up there. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right. The next question. Uh, please explain the reinsurance re provision of HB 2391. Is the state of Oregon now the insurer against the extraordinarily large claims? Janet? Oregon has had a reinsurance program in the past. It is a common mechanism that um, provides stability for health insurance markets um, across the country. The federal government is interested in creating stability in the individual market and commits funds for states to create reinsurance programs. Oregon had one and it expired in 2016 um, and this allows us to reinstate that and uh, essentially it operates as I said that a, some of the assessment money is matched with federal money and goes to covering a certain number, a, a certain kind of claim, which are the very most expensive. And what that does is it alleviates, it, it, it allows insurers um, to simply lower the price that they charge their customers. It's very effective in stabilizing a market. Um, so, um, I think that, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. My time is up, but I'm happy to take other questions about it. Did one of you want to respond? No. <laughs> I think she hit the nail on the head. That's accurate. Look, there's no lowering of insurance premiums. That's a joke. If anybody in this room has ever purchased health care on the open market, I'm one of them. Since I started doing it, it has increased 20% every single year. And Measure 101 implies a tax of 1.5% on top of that. There is no reduction of premiums. It's an absolute, it's absolute hogwash what they're saying. It simply doesn't exist. This is a tax on the half of Oregon, Oregon that simply can't afford a lobbyist in Salem to carve themselves out of these taxes, while everyone else, large corporations, unions, insurance companies, are held harmless. They don't pay these taxes. This is why Measure 101 is in front of you. It is one of the most egregious forms of taxation we've seen in a long time. And to Dr. Bruce's point, if health care is a human right, why are we taxing some people's health care and not others? The question is, if ballot measure 101 fails, how long uh, do we have to replace the failed bill before losing federal funding? The, the short session starts in February, so literally a week later, after Oregonians say, nope, we're not okay with you taxing our health care, and we don't want our hospitals taxed either, they are going to have to come back to the drawing board and figure out a more equitable and fair solution. And Jeff and I have described what several of those scenarios could look like. Part of what um, we didn't mention is that there is 47 million more dollars in the revenue forecast. They didn't know about that when they passed House Bill 2391. So there's more and more money coming into the state, and yet they're budgeting based on a false number. And our argument is that there's plenty of money and they can come back to the drawing board a week after the election and get it right.
So, um, Oregon, Oregon has established a budget that covers the Oregon Health Plan for the biennium. And if Measure 101 were to go down, all the assumptions about the resources for this biennium would not would would be in chaos because the measures are already in place. Um, hospitals are already paying an additional contribution as well as insurers. There isn't a plan B. There isn't one <coughs> off the shelf that lawmakers can take up and pass. What's being referred to here is, is um, a proposal that was vetted in discussion and it was clear that there were either not enough money that was raised, they are simply were in terms of the tobacco uh, tax that would not raise nearly as much money as needed, nor none of the other solutions that were offered were um, able to raise the money or they had already been counted. So they're really, I, I really appreciate the um, the effort about finding alternative, but it has been already considered and it was not credible or workable. Uh, what evidence, there's been discussion about insurance premiums decreasing if, uh, ballot, if Measure 101 passes. What evidence do we have that insurance premiums will decrease? So our organization, and myself in particular, wrote an FAQ. Um, it's on our website, and one of the questions that takes up is, is what happens to um, individuals' insurance? Um, and in that explanation is a link to a document that, um, and conversations that I had with the state agency, the actuaries there, who determined that the, that the impact of the reinsurance program um, was going to be a 6% reduction in premiums uh, this year, even considering the uh, cost of the assessment. So that information is in a link on our website. Thank you. You know, I, I simply don't know how this message translates into the real world. If anybody out there is purchasing their own health insurance plan or you're trying to do so for your employees, or you're even part of the large group market, like our school districts, this is not going to save you money. Our school districts will be hit, if Measure 101 passes, $25 million will be sucked out of our school districts to pay for this tax. The Beaverton School Superintendent was just caught on his email to his staff admitting that this tax will cost their district 540 grand a year. There is no lowering of insurance costs. If you look at House Bill 2391, it is explicit in the language of the bill that insurance companies will pass and can pass this tax onto their ratepayers, which is all of us in this room, it's a farce. So make, make no mistake, insurance companies can raise their premiums any way they want. They can do whatever they want with it. It has to be approved by DCBS, but they can raise it any way they want. What we're saying here is that the added cost of this 1.5% tax if the insurance companies didn't raise their premiums and you were paying the same as you're paying this year, you would see a $300 decrease. We're not saying the insurance companies are not going to raise your premiums. They can do it for whatever reason they want. And they do it for whatever, you know, the money, right? Um, so uh, some misstatements and misunderstandings and difference in opinions about the perspective here. Jeff, did you want to say something? I'm just a farmer, fifth-generation Oregon farmer. 
So math for me is pretty simple. Uh, if you increase the cost of my fertilizer, that means my cost went up. I'm sorry. So if you're going to increase the cost of health care on hospitals, and by the way, many of you in the audience, who are on, I, some of you are on Medicare, right, like my dad, okay? You're, you're not going to pay the uh, insurance premium on this, but you're going to have higher hospital costs because of it. The cost of health care is going to go up. It's, it's the way economics work. It's silly to say that increasing the cost of health care is going to lower the cost of health care. I'm sorry, um, it just doesn't work in the real world. All right. Well, the next, but, folks, but, but can we both, have both no, uh, no participation? I mean, the audience, the questions are for the presenters, so I'm sorry. If you have a question, you can write it down and send it back to us. Um, why do opponents of Measure 101 keep saying that big businesses and unions are excluded from the tax on insurance premiums when the tax is on insurance companies, not other businesses or unions, and when the text of the measure doesn't exclude any insurance companies? Measure 101 taxes exclude large corporations who are big enough to self-insure, it excludes unions, and that includes PEB, the Public Employee Benefits Board. They got a carve out from the general fund to actually pay their tax for them. And it excludes insurance companies themselves. Basically, if you are wealthy enough to afford a lobbyist in Salem, you are not gonna pay these taxes. Everybody else, including me, gets stuck with the bill. It's pretty plain and simple. And if you look at the people who are supporting the yes on 101 vote. I encourage you to pick up my literature over there on the table. They are close to three million dollars spending trying to convince you that you ought to raise your own health care taxes in order to keep the spigot of funding coming in for the expansion of Medicaid. It's disgusting. These are your tax dollars they're using against you to convince you to raise your own taxes. agree with Lindsay in um, one respect. Um, but first of all, I want to clarify who is um, who the insurance assessment applies to. And I'm reading from your voters pamphlet. The 1.5% 1 per 1 assessment on premiums and premium equivalents of health uh, apply to health insurance companies, the Public Employees Benefit Board, managed care organizations for a two-year period. It does not apply to self-insured um, companies. Those are generally larger companies. The legislature extended these in this assessment to, this, to the extent of the law. Federal law bars states from applying these types of assessments to self-insured um, organizations. And if the legislature would have done what Lindsay is suggesting, it would have provoked a lawsuit which would have destabilized people's health insurance. Thank you. Can I respond to that? As I just said, the Public Employee Benefits Board was paid their tax for them from the general fund, 12 million bucks out of the general fund of your tax dollars paid that tax for them ahead of time. It is disingenuous to say that the unions or large corporations or the insurance companies themselves that have been allowed to pass this tax on to you are going to pay these taxes. It's wholly disingenuous. Thank you. I may have a, a follow-up comment, but um, 
let's, I will probably be able to work it into another question. This is uh, too short of a time, thanks. So, uh, House Bill 2391 only provides a two-year budget solution and is not permanent. How much is this single-issue election costing the state? How much is being spent by the support and the opposition? Does anybody know the answers to that? Lindsay, that's it. <laughs> Go ahead, Lindsay. Do you have it all? She's the answer lady. Well, so the first, uh, first part is how much is the single issue election costing the state? Okay, so on that question, I don't know the exact dollar number, but I do know that it is the responsibility of the Democratic leadership in Salem for scheduling at the election at the most inopportune time of the year, which would be in about three weeks. So if you have questions for them as to why they chose the state, I would direct them to the Democratic legislator. I, I, I was told that number was $3.2 million for the statewide special the election. Cost. Okay. Yeah. And then how much is being spent by the uh, people that want to vote yes and the people that are saying vote no? So the people who are promoting a yes vote, I touched on this a little bit earlier, if you look at their CNEs, and I printed out some of them over there, I encourage you to look them up. It's two packs. It's called Protect Our Healthcare and Yes for Healthcare. Combined, these two political action committees are set to spend about $3 million of Medicaid profiteer money to convince you that you need to raise your taxes in order to continue to fund them. It pretty, sounds pretty backwards, but that's exactly what's going on. The major donors to these PACs are Medicaid uh, CCOs, Coordinated Care Organizations, whose entire business model is predicated on your tax dollars. Every single dime that goes into a CCO comes from everybody in this room. And they are spending your own tax dollars against you to convince you to raise your taxes the no side, I call us the little engine that could because we really don't have a whole lot of money and we are basing our entire campaign off of the 90,000 Oregonians who worked their butts off over the summer to gather signatures to force this to the ballot so they could protect themselves from higher taxes. You don't have a financial figure of what the no side's spending. Hmm. No, I don't, actually. So you don't know that? Nope. Hey, Bruce, do you? Well, that's curious. They don't know how much money they're spending. Hmm. They have all this information, but don't know how much money they're spending, but they know how much the other side is spending. Well, I did see, actually, numbers, and I was surprised um, that the $3 million number was actually equal in both camps. I'm sorry, I can't. Re I, I I am not lying to you about this. We do not sure. have um, $3 and, million. And so uh, <laughs> you know, you really have to wonder why they can't give us a, a figure here tonight on I that. Need to Always that. That's absolutely true. Yeah. We're just going to You don't have any specifics on this. That, that is it. absolutely a truth. We do not have three million dollars. I wish we had that kind of money. There is no way. This is a grassroots campaign from your neighbors <laughs> who have put this on the ballot and are asking you to stand. Nice All right. Ball. So, folks, let's we'll act like one time out. out. Time out. Let's just go back. <laughs> Somebody's lying. So, so uh, uh, allow me. Janet gets to okay. go next right. because Lindsay had a second. So I just wanted to comment on um, Lindsay's reflection on the business of CCOs. They were created solely to serve Medicaid patients. The only way they do that is with public dollars. Our, our contribution is matched with many, many more federal dollars and allows low-income individuals to have health care. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. Thank you. Most of those CCOs are for-profit entities. That's right. And uh, we do not have the right for, to um, engage in public records requests because they are not considered, they're considered to be private organizations. So you can make public records requests and they'll deny it under Oregon's law. Okay? They're for-profit entities. All right? Second thing is, let me just set the record straight. If you look at what's the name of your pack? 
Mine is separate from the campaign. The campaign is called Stop Healthcare Taxes. Okay, Stop Healthcare Taxes. If you go on Oregon's website, you can see how much money they've raised. Doctor, it is not $3 million. It's going to cost $3 million to conduct the election, which we, the taxpayers, are going to pay for. All right, fine. It is not $3 million, okay? We just don't have that kind of money, all right? We do know that the other side, if again, if you look at the actual state figures, has raised about $3 million. Is that about right? Yes. Okay. So, and by the way, have you seen any no on 101 ads running on TV? You haven't. But I bet you've seen the yes on ads. That ought to tell you who's got the money. All right, another question. I've been told by a religious friend that voting yes uh, equals voting to have taxpayer money pay for abortions. Where does this come from? Anybody want to take that one? Yeah. Um, actually, Measure 101 is not directly linked to taxpayer-funded abortion. Taxpayer-funded abortion came out of the general fund. That portion, I believe it was $10 million that was devoted to that. Um, so it's, there's not a direct link there, but I suppose you could say, hey, we got to use that $10 million on, you know, the Medicaid population. But that's really up to you to decide. There's no direct correlation there. Did either of you want to respond? I do not have any separate information in, um, about that. Uh, why are corporations not contribute to this cause? Uh, who wanted it? Well, I could. Okay, the, the question was, why are corporations not required to contribute to this cause? The reason is um, a law called ERISA, and it was set up to allow um, businesses to self-insure and to protect their ability to do that. There are rules around states being able to regulate them and there's been, um, so that's the reason that these kinds of assessments um, can't apply to self-insured plans. It's a real problem, uh, admittedly, um, across the country, but there's been not a lot of success in challenging it, and that's why the legislature chose did not include it because because it's simply not permitted under federal law. Um, as I said, it's under ERISA law, and that's basically the overarching um, legal framework that shields them from these kinds of assessments. Did either of you want to respond? that may be the case, but does that make it fair? We have one of, if you look in your voter pamphlet statement, there is a statement on the no side from an owner of a large corporation who self-insures. He's not going to pay this tax. Doesn't apply to him. But what he's saying is, is it fair that corporations like Nike and Intel get carved out of this kind of taxation when the rest of us get stuck with the bill. That's his point. And his point is, if Medicaid is a shared societal responsibility, which I agree it is, then why are some people in Oregon being targeted for their health insurance plans, while others, a large number of others, arguably half the state, is being carved out of paying these taxes? It is fundamentally unfair and inequitable. Vote result reinsurance program resulting in an average rate increase of $300 per year for 210,000 Oregonians per the Department of Consumer and Business Services. Yes. <laughs> you got that right. I couldn't have said it better.
either of you? No, I think we've uh, discussed that. <laughs> yeah, like, you've agreed on that. Okay. Uh, if a person cannot see a doctor, won't they end up in the ER passing on higher costs to consumers anyway? So I spent some time, uh, you know, um, the Oregon experiment uh, was uh, reported on two years after uh, the Medicaid expansion was adopted here in Oregon. <clears throat> and what they found, and this, you can still find this story online because I found it this morning online, is that emergency room use by Medicaid expansion individuals increased, did not go down. Fast forward to today. Uh, in uh, August of 2017, there was another report uh, by four PhDs who work in emergency uh, medicine analysis. I didn't print that out and bring it with me, but their conclusion was across the country that emergency room use by Medicaid expansion individuals has actually gone up, has not gone down. So that was one of the goals. It was stated early on is that we would have less uh, emergency room use. Apparently that's not been the case. There's a myriad of reasons why, perhaps. But uh, that's what's out there on the internet. You can read it for yourself. Bruce or Janet? I have seen the research um, that the representative is referring to, and that is a national figure. Um, the figures in Oregon, though, are that emergency room use is, has been going down. What's your source? It, the Oregon Health Authority? Yeah. And we have been at this business of health transformation a little bit longer than other states, so we have more um, experience and time under our belt to um, perfect the, um, the goals of coordinating care and to provide excellent care so that people stay healthy and out of the ER. There's no doubt that Oregon has saved um, money through its coordinated care efforts. And I think that this is relevant to Measure 101 because it, it, Measure 101 allows that to continue. Having the premise of um, transformation is that people have access to health care. And I think there's no doubt that we all want that for the purpose of controlling costs. That's why we're doing this. Thanks. There has been no cost savings on the expansion of Medicare. In 2014, we were spending $3 billion on Medicaid. We are now spending over $7 billion on Medicaid expansion. It is not saving us money. And coordinated care organizations, as Jeff stated, most of them are for-profit corporations. They are making millions of dollars off of the expansion of Medicaid. There simply is no cost savings. And the, amount, the number of people on Medicaid has actually been falling, and there's several reasons for that. We can get into that a little bit later. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just have to correct a misstatement here. There are 16 CCOs, uh, uh, 14 of them are not-for-profit, two of them are for-profit. One of the for-profit ones sold uh, down in um, Lane County, and that created a big uh, ripple tidal wave effect of trying to uh, in improve transparency uh, in the CCO structure. And the, the biggest opponents to that uh, transformation of, of increasing transparency um, ha have actually been uh, uh, the, uh, the Republican side of, of, our, of our legislature. Uh, Mitch Greenlake uh, has uh, always wanted to have increased uh, transparency so we could actually do the audits, look at the audits, and know where the money is going. Um, but those attempts in the legislature have been defeated. Uh, no doubt by the hospital lobby and uh, uh, as uh, all the associated uh, CEOs. Is it true that these kind of provider assessments are used in 49 other states? 
Yes, it is true. And it's true that Oregon uh, started this back in 2004. It's how we uh, first uh, funded the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, this is a common technique that's used. Um, this has all been uh, done before. Which it, it, the, the reason we did away with it in uh, 2014 was because the federal dollars were coming in paid for 100%. Now, four years later, there's a scale back. The federal, the state has to pay 5% five, 5 of it, and next year, 6%. And the legislature is trying to figure out a way to make, make all of that happen for us. And what happens when the federal government drops down 10% and we have to cover 10%? What do you think happens to the new assessments or taxes that are being proposed in Measure 101 if it passes. They are going to increase. There's no doubt about it. They will go up in order to fund the increased cost and the lack of federal reimbursement. In fact, on OPB, just last week, the SEIU lobbyist admitted on air that that was the case that their long-term plan is to raise those assessments. They just have to get their foot in the door, which is what they're asking you to do, is to pass brand new forms of taxes so they can get their foot in the door and raise them later when the federal government says, oh, we're not gonna reimburse as much. States, you're gonna have to pick it up. That's exactly what the plan is. So what exactly is plan B? How much time do you have? <laughs> I don't know if I can fit it in two minutes. <laughs> Maybe each of you can give a minute's worth of exactly what yeah. plan B is. <laughs> Rattle it off. We'll give you a little extra. I, I think I'll go over a minute, but look, the secretary, and this is what <clears throat> is so frustrating, I think, is House Bill 2391 passed before the Oregon Secretary of State released his audit. It came after the bill was passed. And when he released the audit, he said he found that 50,000 people, at least 50,000 people, were ineligible for Medicaid, but were still receiving it. So we spend, we send a check, a $430 check every single month, and we were doing so for 50,000 people who were not even eligible to receive Medicaid. What do you think that does for the rest of the population that plan needs plan, it? Please cover plan B. Yeah. I am it, covering plan no, B. You're just complaining. That represents, <laughs> excuse me, that represents at least $100 million of your tax money. $100 million that could have gone to ensure that the rest of people on Medicaid actually continue to receive it. That's what that represents. The tax on hospitals. Why does it have to be a hard tax on hospitals that's sent directly to you? Why can't it be through the closed loop assessment that gets reimbursed by the federal government? Why did they carve it out and make it directly a tax on you? That represents about $200 million that we are missing out on in federal reimbursement. I'm up to what, $300 million so far? And what's our hole? $330, okay. $47 million more in new revenue that this state was not expecting to take in. I'm already up to $347 million. We've covered the whole. We didn't need to raise taxes on other people's health care to pay for the expansion of Medicaid, period. The Oregon Health Authority, we all know, has done, has covered 350,000 people and did that um, in a very short period of time, for which I'm grateful, as well as my brother-in-law. We know that there were some who were uh, deemed eligible who were not. Their coverage was paid for 100% with federal dollars. The monies that we need to raise have to originate from the state to be matched in the Medicaid program. 
So any say any money that could be recouped from the fifty from the fifty thousand individuals who are deemed ineligible, that money is federal money and it is not eligible uh, to be matched. So it is it cannot be used to fill the hole. There are new revenues. Oregon's economy is doing well. We have a kicker. The kicker will kick. Most of that that money, that extra money, that above the above what was expected, is not going to be available to to any of us for the Medicaid program. That's why Measure 101 is critical to pass. Kicker money is your money. Yes, it it's is. your tax dollars you've paid. Okay, and if the state collects more than what they budgeted for, that's your money. It needs to come back to you. And you know what? If you want to give it to the state, you can write an extra check to the state. Did you know that? You can do that today. And they'll take it. Because, believe it or not, there are some people who actually do that. So, um, there is a lot of new revenue coming to Oregon. Oregon, in this last budgetary cycle, had $1.5 billion more to spend, but it wasn't enough because the politicians wanted to spend even more because they saw so government so big before you become like some European countries where you're paying 70% of your income in taxes. No, yeah, thank you. But they get a lot for it. Not really. They do. Not, not in my opinion, they do not. Sorry. Hey, Wendy, I turned in the numbers that were spent. It was seventy thousand dollars was raised by the by the no. Do you know what? We'll have, we, I'm sorry, but, we're not but, taking but, information no, but, in the but, audience. But, but right it's now. answering a question that they didn't have the numbers for. Raised the no on health care was seventy thousand dollars. Was raised and ten thousand dollars was left over on twelve thirty one. Not three million dollars. Seventy thousand. All right, uh, we are getting to the end. I'm going to take uh, one more quick question, and then uh, we'll go to the closing statements. So this question is, will Measure 101 affect people getting insurance through the marketplace? Will it affect people getting insurance through, through the, the marketplace? marketplace? Absolutely. It's a direct assault on people getting insurance through the marketplace. It is a 1.5% tax on anyone who purchase a health, purchases a health plan through the marketplace. It doesn't matter if you are a small business owner or if you're a family or an individual or a large group market, meaning our school districts. Our school districts buy the health, their health insurance on the market through the large, the large group market. It doesn't matter. You will be taxed a percent and a half on your health care premiums. It is an absolute assault on anybody who could not carve themselves out of the taxes and, and be held harmless from these new taxes. The answer is yes. The, uh, the reinsurance program does lower costs for people in the marketplace. That is part of the individual market. So um, that, that is correct. Maybe I should just continue and clarify that those insurers can, um, they're affected by the reinsurance. So they pay a 1% assessment and they can lower their premiums by 6% because of the reinsurance program, in large part, well, because it's a, a pool that is created across the entire marketplace, but also there are federal funds that go to help make that occur. And I, and I hope that that's helpful. We're not taking questions. I have a minute. Okay. A minute? Oh, yes! <laughs> We're repeating each other at this point anyway, so... <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
What Measure 101 does, and this is why it's in front of you, keep in mind 2391, House Bill 2391, had multiple tax mechanisms in it. And all of the rest of those tax mechanisms are already functioning. They're already producing revenue. We pulled out the most egregious forms of taxation, the new taxes, the new spigots, if you will, of revenue for the folks who administer Medicaid. And we said, these are unfair, they're inequitable, and they're unsustainable. And I think that we've talked, we've covered pretty much all three of those things tonight. And I hope that you stand with the 90,000 Oregonians who agree and who put this on the ballot in front of you. Because there is, if, if Medicaid is a shared societal responsibility, then everybody ought to have skin in the game. Uh, so a week ago, um, Representative uh, Rayfield and Representative Cedric Hayden uh, went at it uh, in a forum at the Eugene City Council. You can get it on klcc.org. Um, and listen to it because it's very interesting. What it boils down to is, yes, uh, what Ced Cedric, Hayden, uh, had Cedric Hayden said was that um, we agree on 90 to 95 percent of it, and the, that other 5 to 10 percent, we just have a difference of opinion. So what we're talking about here is a difference of opinion. And, you know, why, why should we jeopardize people's health care uh, over a difference of political opinion would be my closing statement. So my closing statement boils down to this. We have the money to pay for this. You don't need a new tax. There's a year's worth of money in the bank to pay for this program. We have plenty of savings that we can find. We've had plenty of audits accepted by the director of OHA of the hundreds of millions of dollars they have misspent. Why would you give them more money? And why would you allow certain people to not pay this tax and other people pay it? If it's for everybody, then it ought to be for everybody. Thank you very, very much for coming tonight. Um, measure 101 is critical to protecting health care. In Oregon, it protects health care for over a million. It's um, critical um, for affordable health care for people buying it on their own. There's no other revenue solution in the wings um, that lawmakers can take off the shelf and pass next month. Overturning Measure 101 is no way to find a better solution. Gambling with a million people's health care and holding them hostage is not a path to a better solution. Democrats and Republicans support Measure 101. Ted Ferrioli is out there banging the doors for Measure 101. There are 160 groups um, listed on the Yes on Measure 101 website that represent consumers and every single constituency that has a that has a stake in this. So I would suggest that the measure is known by the company it keeps. Take a look at that list and vote yes on Measure 101. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the presenters, AAUW, the library for allowing us to hold this meeting, the audience for coming and for all the good questions that you asked. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. There were way more questions than we had time for, unfortunately. Um, don't forget to check out the tables, sign up to get information from the League of Women Voters of Lynn County if you're interested, and uh, have a nice evening. <laughs>